It's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you, GFOA, for inviting me to moderate a panel with the folks who were at the division, running the division, before I got here. I get to blame them for everything that was wrong before. <laughs> I now sit where each of you once sat, and I can assure everyone here that it only takes about a week on the job to realize that it really is the best and worst job in New Jersey government. Every one of our panelists approached it with enthusiasm and a passion for the work, and you've each left a real mark on the division and the state of New Jersey in a lot of different ways. With that said, and given that so many of you know and have worked with our panel already, and because our time is limited, rather than going through preliminaries, I'd like to jump right into questions. So, to get things started, the most uh, collegial of notes, could each of you just briefly give us an introduction about how you got into local government and why have you stayed? You want to start with Al? Sure. Why I got into local government? Well, before I, uh, I got into local government after I graduated college, I was putting myself through college as a construction laborer. And I don't know if you've ever worked on the docks of Brooklyn in 20 degree weather, but when you look at your hands and they're blue, you figure you need an office job. <laughs> and uh, I started working for the township of Montclair with Manchu Shah as my supervisor. So, that, that being said, obviously after a couple of years it was time to move on quickly. But, um, <laughs> just kidding, I'm on you. But, um, but I did realize shortly that uh, in municipal government there was a lot of challenges. Um, you would never get rich, but you could make a comf comfortable living. And you'd also have time for yourself. It wasn't like some of my other friends that were, you know, in these jobs where they were working 24-7. And uh, after a few years and, and constant rotation of cha challenges, um, I, after 15 years, I wound up at the division. So uh, I got into it because um, I wanted to be in government, but I didn't want to run for office. I didn't want to have to campaign. I didn't want to have to raise money, which obviously takes a lot of time. And I wanted a position in government that I could move around. and. God knows I've moved around a lot, uh, especially in New Jersey. But I started off as a city manager in Oklahoma, moved into New Jersey and never left. So uh, it, is, it is a great job. It's a great opportunity. I mentor a lot of young ones that come through, and actually one's right down here. And, and it's, it, there cannot be described a better job, uh, although it's done with great um, disdained by the public, but it's still a great job. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm coming to the end of my career, but um, it's been a great job and a great opportunity. And I'm hoping all of you out there that are young, get into it. If you ever have the chance to be the director of local government services, take it. Um, it's not easy, it's not, it, it, it's, it's, it's time consuming, it's, it's stressful but it is one of the best positions in the state, as, as the current director has said, it's the best position in the state. I strongly recommend if you can do it, you get that opportunity, don't pass by. I almost passed it by, because I was like, I, I hate that guy, you know? So <laughs> it was him. And, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, it was the best thing I did. I didn't do it for long, because, you know, I have no patience for people, so, uh, but it, it is very good, and I'm, I was glad that Sujay took over for me when, when I left, and I'm very happy about that, so there you go. I was kidnapped by pirates. <laughs> <laughs> and government, government was actually, is actually my third career. And my second career was as a medical malpractice attorney, and I got tired of literally chasing ambulances. So I applied for a law, uh, an ad in the Law Journal to be the solicitor in Cherry Hill. And I knew nothing about government. I didn't even know the difference between an ordinance and a resolution. But I enjoyed uh, the give and take, and I think when you drill down to that level, you're actually helping people. And then when my mayor went up to be the commissioner, my first job in state government was actually as 
the attorney for the GRC. We can boo Oprah now if you'd like. Very good. The bane of my existence. And then she called me up to her office one day and she says, I've got another job for you. She says, I want you to be the director of local government service. I said, oh, I hate numbers. But she says, it's okay, you can do it. And it is the best job in state government because I think you actually get to see um, the help, you get to reach out, you get to know people on a very personal level and you can actually do some good out there. When I was four or five years old, I wanted to be a superhero, complete with cape and leaping buildings, you know, at a single bound. But um, I found out when I went to local government services that I get to do that every day and hopefully I use my powers for good along the way. And then Tom Neff became the bane of my existence in my last couple of years there. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why I got in local government. I can't figure it out other than I applied to Walmart and they said no. <laughs> I applied to Burger King and they said no. And then Tom Rochelle was the CFO and manager in Morristown and he was tired of wearing two hats and he was desperate and he told me Morristown was the greatest place in the world and I should go work there and I did. And now he doesn't have to wear two hats and I get to... The glory of uh, dealing with crazy constituents, reasonable uh, elected officials, and nighttime council meetings that end at a reasonable time. So I love it. Um, that's why. Good afternoon. Um, my answer for how I got into local government is uh, pretty easy and concise. I, like many of you, was an accounting major. Like many of you, I worked in the private industry. I did a fixed asset and tax accounting for a bunch of R&D firms in Princeton, and I was absolutely miserable. And I had a friend who worked for the Mercer County Improvement Authority at the time, and she said, we're hiring. I didn't know what an improvement authority was, but I said, I'm in. And um, that was my introduction to local government. Uh, I fell in love with it and um, bounced around in it for uh, almost two decades now. So, now that we know how everybody got here, let's get down to uh, your background with the division, some experiences that you've had. Whenever we interview somebody at the division, we usually pose a few hypotheticals, and we ask those candidates, you know, how would you handle whatever the situation may be? Often they respond, when would that ever happen? We giggle and go, oh, twice already this year. So, what was your most memorable Truth is stranger than fiction moment, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> um, I do remember one, what was I? Was, I think it was July. And the time they called it Extraordinary Eight. And I was on vacation and the numbers, I guess the budget hadn't been passed uh, the state budget hadn't been passed. Oh, what a surprise. I know you're all shocked. <laughs> and I was actually on vacation in Myrtle Beach playing golf. Uh, I wasn't really playing golf. I was chasing this white ball around. But I got a call that said, we're ready to give out transitional aid or extraordinary aid. I said, I'm like in the middle of the golf course doing this. And I still have this. I had a paper placemat that I took the call and they gave what all the um, awards were along with the mayor and the phone number. So in the middle of Myrtle Beach, I have this placemat telling what the awards were and all the mayors out there thought we do all these machinations and I'm calling them from the 19th hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, telling them what their awards were. But to me, that was, that was very surreal. But government goes on. It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. And government goes on, and we have to push through it. So I think that was one of my most surreal moments I had. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> when I was uh, director and chairman of the local finance board, we had 
three mayors that were real problems. And uh, they all wound up going to jail with, with our help. Um, Sarah Bost was one in Irvington, Marty Barnes up in Patterson. But we had so much trouble with Milton Milan in Camden that when we actually learned that he went to jail, the commissioner of DCA and I danced in front of the, in front of the DCA building. <laughs> and, and that was pretty surreal. I can't think of I can't think of one. I, I guess you know the, the part of the fun of doing this was when you get to um, call people down um, when they're screwing up completely, um, and and I guess one of the fun times it was fun for me. It wasn't fun for my colleague. Um, we had back when there was staff before, you know, after Tom and. Tim had it, they didn't have any staff. We, we, we actually got to enjoy having a few people on staff. So when, uh, when um, I was told of a small, of a problem that one town was having, they didn't have a CFO, the administrator thought he could do it. And they brought in a letter to me that, that said, we need to send this to the mayor and administrator of this town to tell them to get a CFO because they haven't had one. This long drawn out story I said, just give me, I know who this is. I called him up, a friend of mine who was the administrator, I called him up, and he thought, you know, it was a friendly call. He said, gee, the director is calling me. I said, yeah, yeah, we're friends for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. And then I laid into him with a certain language that I won't repeat here, but those of you that worked with me know that I, I in my past life, I came, I was a truck driver. So I told him in no uncertain term, he had 24 hours to hire a CFO or I would tear, come in and with my staff and actually come in with Pfeiffer, because that's all you need, um, and, 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 and tear your town to pieces. Well, you know, that was it. 24 hours, you had a CFO. So I, I think one, that's one of those, those, those fun moments where you think, you know, gee, I can really do something good. You know, and I had a similar situation with a mayor that didn't pass the, the budget and, I, you know, threatened them with the fines and everything that we can do to Matt, it. I'm hearing a theme. Yeah, yeah well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Joe worked with me, he knows this is what we do. And so, you know, it, it, the irony of that moment was that uh, uh, little did I realize that 15 years later, I'd be working for that same town. So uh, <laughs> it, it is, it is a, it's an unusual position and, and one that you get to do some fun things that are surreal. So do you guys want to answer this one or move on to the next one? Whatever you want. Yeah, take it away. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, Mike, so Mike, I can't help it, but the assemblywoman who was a councilwoman in Trenton at the time is sitting in the front row, so I'm debating whether I should tell this story or not. <laughs> but she is truly one of the beacons of light in that city at the time. So. Um, I was on the job for all of, I think, three months as director, maybe two months. And shortly after I got there, it came to my uh, notice that we had no staff to really oversee the six or seven uh, towns that were financially distressed to the point that they truly needed state oversight in terms of their hires and to make sure that their finances were stable. And we had hired nobody yet. So it basically was me and one other person in my office named Aaron Needler who were responsible for looking at every single hire in, um, I think at the time it was actually 20 towns and cities to make sure they were reasonable, to make sure their vendor decisions were reasonable and appropriate. So we didn't have any time to really review anything other than really we looked to make sure they had a bidding process for vendors and uh, we were making sure that they were choosing the low bidder and that there wasn't something grossly out of line and otherwise we approved what they were doing until we got people who were hired on a full-time basis to re review things more carefully. And we had just approved a low vendor, a low bidder, to be the IT services in Trenton. And it can't, I got a number of phone calls from people in Trenton who were saying, we can't believe this vendor was hired in Trenton. They, they don't know what they're doing, they stink. The old vendor was perfectly good, they got rid of him for political purposes. And I kinda listened with half an ear and I assumed, oh, you know, these are people who just liked it the way it was, they're resistant to change. 
They don't want to move on to something that may be better or different. They're complaining for no good reason. And I got a few more calls. And then I got a call from the CFO or the head of their finances at the time. You know, they're licensed in tenure, and the CFOs are always the straight shooters. Uh, she called and she said, you know, this vendor really stinks. They don't know what they're doing. They're not qualified. They've never worked in a municipality before. They don't have any services that can, can handle IT needs of, you know, the finance system, the hiring system, code enforcement, anything. And I said, okay, I better take this seriously. The CFO was calling. So I called the mayor. And I had never met him before, never talked to him. And I said, Mayor Mack, I said, <laughs> can you just, can you, what due diligence did you do to make sure that this hire, this new vendor, who's going to handle your IT services, is qualified and capable of providing services. And I expected him to give me a line that was sort of like, you know, we did our due diligence and he'll be perfectly good. And he literally said to the guy who's regulating his town and overseeing it, he said, these people are a bunch of crybabies. Don't they understand? I get to pick my friends. He said, to the victor go the spoils. <laughs> I'm not making that up. God's honest truth. And I just, I, he was on speakerphone, and I looked at the only other person, Aaron, who was working with me, and I was like, oh, we better hire some more people quickly, because this, <laughs> this is the problem. And then, sort of, um, you know, like my colleague was saying over here, I did a happy dance on the front steps when he went to jail, because I had spent about three years of my time, 50% of my time was dealing with insane things that were going on there. But that was, that was one of my surreal moments. I also had a mayor go to jail, but um, that's, that's, that's not my uh, surreal moment. Um, it, there's a lot of them, but one stands out for me, and it was the day that the local finance board voted to uh, enact a state takeover of the city of Atlantic City. Um, and the reason it was surreal for me, I'm pretty comfortable in front of a, a microphone. I never had that kind of, um, almost like out of a cartoon where an entire press gaggle got me outside of the, the, the boardroom in the hallway and I had channel three, six and 10 and the reporters were live tweeting it and people are texting me saying, oh my God. I mean, the Philadelphia Inquirer's lead tweet was a picture of me. This is Tim Cunningham, the man who has all the power in Atlantic City. That was surreal. I don't think I'll ever replicate that in my career. <laughs> And we fixed it. It's perfect now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's one that I'm putting on because when we were prepping for this session initially, trying to see who was interested, we've had two emails, it counts. <laughs> and one of those emails was a response that said, oh, this will be easy. Everything was perfect when I was there and everything sucks now that you're there. <laughs> so Tom. <laughs> <laughs> what was something that you did when you were at the division that you wish everybody in the state was still doing now? <laughs> laughing? <laughs> I don't, um, honestly, and I mean it as no criticism of the current director at all, because this comes, this comes from a different place, but you know, when I got to the division, uh, we really enhanced the amount of oversight that was going on in places like Camden and Newark and, and Trenton, Patterson, some of the rural places that were having equally uh, difficult financial problems. And we really did, um, uh, in an effort to really professionalize that system, we brought in a number of managers, former CFOs, to oversee those places. And I thought we did a really good job, and I was really proud of it. And I, and I I think that there's a little bit of backsliding on that now, and it's more of a function, not of anyone in this room at all, but you know, just by virtue of how Trenton works, there's ebbs and flows. I think some of those places that are distressed have a little bit more influence now over uh, folks in Trenton than they once did, and it's a little harder to impose the sorts of oversight that I think is appropriate and necessary. And I kind of wish that that was still going on the way it was. Um, and again, I mean that as no criticism at all of my colleague who's there now. Uh, it's, we uh, take one minute, too, to say, you know, we, we argue over what's the level of, pro of appropriate oversight from Trenton, but we don't argue with, over whether there should be oversight. It's just what's the degree and how should it function. But I, I had the privilege when I was there of going around the country and speaking in different places before different groups, the, the National GFOA, the uh, market analysts, um, some of the rating agencies in New York, 
And I would do that because I would try and explain to them that New Jersey, we have such a good regulatory system that withstands no matter who's governor, no matter what crazy thing they're trying to do at the, the moment, whichever party it is, um, that it, the regulation is really sound and it's, it's strong. Um, and other states don't have anything like that. And I once spoke to a bond attorney from California, or a, a bankruptcy attorney from California, who was laughing with me and she was saying how she loved her job because she made a fortune off of bankruptcies in California and elsewhere. But we don't have anything like that here. So our, our system's really strong. I do wish it was a little stronger in terms of, of oversight now. Having had a bit of perspective a few years away from the division, curious to hear your answer to that. Well, my reply would pretty much mirror Tom's. Um, after I took the position, uh, one of the staff meetings uh, with the, the governor's cabinet, um, it was talked about that we were giving out over $100 million of aid up and above the formula-driven aid to roughly five communities. And they asked, what, you, what are we going to do? And uh, I said, well, you know, you can't just give them money without any teeth. So at the time, I was working with uh, Dan Reynolds, the Deputy Attorney General, and he determined that we had the ability to go into these communities and tie a level of supervision to the aid that they would receive. And we had a, a letter of, of memorandum um, of understanding that we would be able to get a team of people into their operations and make the changes that we saw fit to, uh, to save money. And uh, we did. We had five communities. Um, I'm sure you all heard that we took over Camden. That was the, probably the biggest one. But we also had Jersey City, East Orange, Patterson, and, and yeah, and Irvington. And um, <clears throat> really, Camden and uh, East Orange were probably the biggest uh, victories for us because. At the time when we started the Stress Cities program, we were giving Camden $45 million on top of their formula-driven aid. And by the time I left, it was down to $9 million. And we also, for the first time, had Camden's financial records and reporting on time. Um, they actually had one year where they uh, adopted their budget the last day of their fiscal year. You know, that's no way to run an operation. So, uh, so like Tom said, I mean, that was one of the things, it was, it was very difficult. It was very demanding. Um, and you had to be in 10 places at once, and there was always fires going. Um, there were lawsuits involved that I was involved in five years after I left the division. Um, I was getting subpoenaed, and, you know, it was, but it was worth it, uh, because I really think we did what was right. Um, I think the, the state of New Jersey is in a better place for what we did, and I commend Dave Miller and Nick Crescenti for their work that they did. I know uh, it's not often that you get accolades for you know what you've done at, at working at the division, but um, I think everybody really gave their heart and soul, and uh, it was very rewarding, although painstaking. All right, you know I'm shy and demure. <laughs> But I'd, I'd like to piggyback a little on what, what Tom was saying. Um, I always saw local government services as really an advocate for, at, when I started there, 566 municipalities, the 21 counties, the authorities, the fire districts, et cetera. And I think what Tom was saying was absolutely correct, and it hasn't changed to this day. Because of the regulations, you know, we haven't had widespread bankruptcies, we haven't had um, widespread financial problems and because of the ability, the statutory authority that we have at local government services, we were able to go in and have some oversight, whether it was just the financial oversight or whether it was more of a, a Camden or Atlantic City type oversight. When you look at these uh, cities that are in distress, sometimes because of their own fault, sometimes not because of their own fault. But the, the one thing I really wanted to say is that I guess when Al was there, we had probably, what, 80 or 90 employees at the time. And so we were able to look 
at everything. That would be lovely. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and that's sort of my whole point. You had, you had enough employees to do the job that we were mandated to do, and we were able to give more, I guess, personal service to everybody. But as the, the legislators decide they want a slimmer government, oftentimes local government services was the primary target there. Or, oh, you really belong in Treasury because they're, they're the numbers people without really recognizing all the CFOs that are out there and all the numbers people the local government had. And I remember when I went in there, um, I had Judy Tripodi, who was tremendous. I had Mark, who was sort of the thorn in my side, but he was very good. Everybody's side. Everybody's side. I'm sorry, Mark is a thorn in everybody's side. Every one of you out there probably as well. Um, You'll hear about it. Yes, he will. But, you know, he was very good at what he did. But we had the luxury of having, uh, when I was there, there were about 60 people. So it was already down 20. But we, we looked at redevelopments. We looked at deferred comp plans. Um, Joe Valenti was there. And for somebody who's never turned on a computer in his life and, and probably has stock in the highlighter market, you know, he was able to do that. Right now, local government services doesn't have the ability um, because they don't have the people in there. It's not that they're not qualified uh, people out there, but I think the legislature has really hamstrung them and what the governments themselves, and you all work in local government, what the government themselves were able to do is they could pick up the phone, they could call up there, they could find a solution to the problems, and you can't do that if you have like three people running around trying to do everybody's job. So I always say that, you know, they're the three greatest lies are, this is the clean version, is the checks in the mail, this speech will be short, and the government's here to help. And I found that local government services was really the one that bucked that trend, because we get, did go out and try to help whether it's by threats or whether it's by sort of conjoling people or trying to get the best CFO, tax collectors, et cetera, in there. But I have to give kudos to the people that were there when I was there, because they're really the ones that taught me, and that's the Joe Valente, Mark Pfeiffer. Judy Tripodi was tremendous. She didn't take nothing from nobody. Um, Tina and Emily were the main people, and Pat Torrent were the main people there when I was there. And they really are the ones that were the heart of the division. And I think that heart needs to have an infusion of people, so. I'm just gonna add briefly to that. I have to say I've been incredibly lucky since joining the division. There's been a tremendous amount of attention and effort put into rebuilding. We've been able to hire 11 people and I hope you guys are starting to see already that little bit of extra attention and time being committed to each of your municipalities. Um, and we're going to keep, keep building. Now, um, this is a forward-looking question for all of you. You've been around local government and seen a lot of things change. What's the biggest challenge that you see coming? And what critical change should people be making now to be ready for it? I think the challenge that local government, or, or at least the DLGS will face, isn't a new one. I think it's something that my colleagues have already discussed. I think it's the preservation of New Jersey's capital markets. Um, I had a conversation with uh, Doug Goldmacher before we came into the room about, um, you know, I'll go back to uh, my biggest challenge at the division, which was Atlantic City. And there was a lot of voices, and Tom, you were in uh, the State House at the time, uh, but there was a lot of voices clamoring for municipal bankruptcy. And there were some of us that um, really fought like hell to stop that from happening and ultimately were successful, um, not solely for the benefit of Atlantic City, because it wouldn't have solved Atlantic City's problem, uh, but, but because it would have cast a pall on the rest of municipal government. So I think that there are going to be instances of other municipalities in the state of New Jersey that are going to have some extraordinary, extraordinary set of circumstances that 
that rattle their finances to the core, and it's going to be incumbent upon the division to keep that hard line and to make sure that New Jersey remains um, the backstop to New Jersey municipal finance. And uh, there's a reason why the last bankruptcy in New Jersey was Fort Lee during the throes of the Great Depression, and it is the Division of Local Government Services. So I think that that's the biggest challenge. I think the, the, the challenge that we've dealt with for decades is going to occasionally be the challenge that the division's going to face going forward. So I, I have the perspective of time in this profession, and, and I think that one of the key things that I'm most concerned about is the quality of your successors, my successors, and the young ones coming up. Um, you just don't see the, 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 the interest in jumping into local government. I mean, uh, you know, youngest one here is probably Melanie, and, and, and I, I, I'm impressed with how much her commitment is coming out of the, the law legal end of things, but people that are coming in through to the to position, I think is most concerning to me because they really don't know how this works and they think they do. So my successors in a couple of towns that, that, you know, they had no experience whatsoever and that town suffers for that. And, and the, the, the lack of training and, and taking care of that municipality uh, I think is the greatest concern that that we have the the regulatory side of this of this of this the division and the ability to monitor towns I think all my colleagues have said the same thing that I would say is is it's there it's just you don't have enough time it was always shocking to me when I got into the position to see how screwed up towns are in New Jersey and how they managed to survive despite people that are running them and 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 I I don't see I can I am very concerned about that and so I know the last several years of that I've focused on trying to mentor people and get programs going to educate to bring people into the position and and generating interest I know it's it's at every level I see that's the interest is is succession because there's just nobody wants to do this. But when you take the beating like Tim did uh, on Atlantic City, you, you have to wonder, why, why would I even do this? Why would I want to put myself out there and do this? And, and it's, it's for the good that you can do. And that is the greatest concern I think we have. And God bless you for getting more people up into yeah. the organization. I, I was lucky I had a lot. I had a lot more. And, and we struggled. But... It, the oversight is needed, and if we don't have good talent coming in that have some experience that have learned in the trenches, it's just you're just not going to be able to do it. Matt, how many did you have? I had about 100. I had 38. I know. <laughs> I don't know how you did. I didn't. <laughs> I think there's a couple of things that uh, we got to look at. Um, one is when the legislature passes law that they took it they take long-term looks at what they're doing because a lot of this stuff is, is designed for the short-term benefit but it has long-term consequences and I don't know what the <clears throat> methodology is now but when I was there when there was pending legislation we were asked to weigh in on it most of the time and there was a lot of back and forth on, on things. Um, you know, when, when they did the pension changes, to Matt's point, if you are an intelligent CFO and you're going to make a decision whether to go into private or public or work for the state or a municipality, you're gonna weigh the whole package as it is as your compensation. And you're gonna make a decision based on that that affects your future. But it's also, you know, the ability of, of the division and municipalities to bring in talent. And I think that there's gonna be ramifications of, of the pension changes because it's not that attractive anymore. So I know when I went in, 
I, I weighed all my different options. And despite that, I chose to work at the township of Montclair. Um, the other thing is, you know, at the, the federal level, where we're looking at tax changes and, you know, the ability to write off your real estate taxes as well as other taxes and what long-term effect that's going to have on our area, property values, tax appeals, and looking ahead, it's really unsure. I mean, in most of, most of the communities in New Jersey, tax collection is their, their lifeline. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the long-term impact of that is going to be, and that's concerning. So what are some common misperceptions that people have about the division's role, and what can we do to better combat them? Asking for advice here for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, I think we said it before, is just getting more people in there because it gets very frustrating from the municipal level if you call up and it's like, well, I don't know, or you have new people in there, or um, they're not available, or things take um, weeks. I got to get an acronym. I'm sorry Mark isn't here because he was like the king of the acronyms. <laughs> so whatever the opposite of FAST is, um, <laughs> but it gets frustrating that the, the philosophy is great. So if you're asking for a friend, I think you're trying to do what you can. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, there are several tiers, whether it's DCA or whether it's the legislature, that um, has to work with you. I've always felt that local government services was the biggest advocate for um, local government because we work all of the direct financial and also sort of the quasi financial and purchasing and all the other things that, that we did at the government and you know our voice needs to be heard local government's voice all of you collectively need to be heard and I think that's one of the biggest things that local government can pass on to the state government to try and say you know, you got to think about this legislation and you bring it in other people will help that. At least when I was there, we were able to look at the legislation and make sort of um, cogent arguments about what whether this was good or whether it was bad or what the long term effects were, whatever. And I don't think right now that's happening. I, mean, I just want to echo that. that's such an important point. Al made and Sue made. The, the legislature keeps passing bills that, and and uh, uh, all due respect uh, out of our colleague in the legislature that's here, that that you know they, they pass these bills. I mean the the that that just do not work. And then you're having to spend time and effort to try to fix that. And we out there in the trenches are trying to administer to it and keep ourselves out of litigation. And it is it is that big gap that now exists that didn't when I was there and I was there where we had an opportunity to weigh in. We had opportunity to comment and make suggestions to the sponsor before they drop bills in and make those changes. We have to rely on the League of Municipalities. They have their own struggle. They're, they have their own constituency. but. The division is uniquely situated to understand you are able to call in what you do, and I applaud you for that, Molly, that you bring in the towns and get comments and do that. Legislature needs to get that in front of it, not behind the laws bill. From, from my perspective, uh, if you were to ask me, uh, a misimpression that people have of the division of local government services it's that the division is not the municipal police and I know in a lot of the towns you work with um, you have gadflies you deal with they all find their way to the division and I would come in and my inbox would be filled with complaints and they were complaints that I just had no jurisdiction to do anything about um, somebody wasn't nice to me at a council meeting <laughs> don't come to a local finance board meeting. Um, 
uh, you know. We just had one the other day. Uh, someone wanted to know why the dead deer weren't being picked up in front of their house. <laughs> Call the mayor. Um, but I, 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 I think that was a, a, an issue that I, I wrestled with when I first got there because, you know, um, although many of us approach the job with a lot of municipal experience, you don't, and, and those of you who heard me speak before, I've heard me say this over and over again, until you land in that director's chair, you don't fully understand the breadth of responsibility of the division. And when you start getting complaint letters, you think that you have to triage every one of them, and it really isn't until you have a little seasoning on the job to you know which ones truly rise to a local government ethics law offense and something else that's just uh, you know much more uh, outside of our lane. So I, th I think that was my, one of my biggest issues of someone not, of, of the using public, not understanding the purpose of the division or our abilities. When a budget comes in or a document comes in from a town, what was the biggest red flag that you looked for that was a sign that something needed to be done now? <laughs> the name of the mayor on the document. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it, wasn't, it was never the document itself that, that for me, at least as a director, drew red flags. It was, it was our staff. You know, and they had a pretty good handle on where the problems were and where they weren't. They knew, they knew which 5% of CFOs weren't maybe where they should be in the job, and they knew which 5% of the municipalities really had um, structural, financial, political problems that made it such that they couldn't adopt sound budgets. That, and that's not a, you, know, you can't quantify that. It's not always something that will be picked up and fast or the system. It's something that's just picked up by people with experience over the years, knowing where the, where the problems are. Um. The problem that we had when we, when we saw a budget that was, wasn't working or there was a structural imbalance, you'd usually, usually see the anticipation of one-time revenues. And you know, that was kind of a red flag, especially if it was of uh, you know, any significant amount. Um, we had one municipality that tried to sell uh, Union City, tried to sell uh, Roosevelt Stadium, you know, to the Board of Education. That's a problem. So, you know, it's kind of a red flag. But um, there, there were others that were similar, but not to the magnitude of that. And then, ironically, they had just bought it from the Board of Education a couple of years prior. So, you know, it's, there are municipalities, like Tom said, that, you know, the name of the mayor or where it comes from it requires extra scrutiny, so, but they deserve it. So a lot of this is about what goes wrong. So I'm just going to redirect you as we head toward the end of the session. What are the things that you see in government that are good signs and that give you hope for the future? I know this is a pretty uh, dour crowd here. But I'm hoping each one of you can come up with something on this one. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Give it to well, Tom. He's Mr. Happy. <laughs> the hope for the future is that I will get a job at Burger King um, <laughs> now that I have the crown. But I, I think that they're, taking, they're recognizing and being able to give you the tools now to repopulate local government services. Uh, for me, it's always been education. I mean, we're preaching to the choir here. You're here because we give a lot of credits, but you're here because you want to learn things. Unfortunately, for the most part, in all the seminars I, I attend or the ones even down at the league, you don't have the people that need to hear the things here. You need the legislators in here. I don't know how to do that. Is there hope for the future? There's hope for the future in here with everybody sitting in this room because this is really the crux of making municipalities work. This is, now, this is my personal opinion. Things like consolidation isn't going to work. Pension reform, yeah, pension reforms needs to be done, but it's not by, oh, let's borrow from the pension fund again. 
So there are things as financial people we know, but every one of you, I'm sure along the way, has had to educate your mayor or your council. Well, you can't really do it this way. Uh, you really shouldn't do these things, but the legislators need to be in here. Is there hope for the future? There's always, there's always hope for the future. And I'm happy more people are getting in there. I'm happy that, that, um, that you are here listening, not just to us, but to all the seminars. But I'll echo what Matt said, is that there's not a lot of people behind you. I mean, some of you are a certain age. You, you know some of our pop culture references, you know. Um, so we need to bring up the people that are educated. And as, as Al said, there's just not the ascent of in government as much as it was before. I know that's not real positive, but. Um, one, one thing, I, a trend I see that's positive, but it, the result is still probably three, four years away. Um, and it's, as you all know, for 10 years, it's been nothing but cut, cut, cut in terms of municipal aid. And that it doesn't matter who the governor is or which part of their party they're from. The structural problem with the state's budget is so much worse than any of yours. It's not even close. You all make your pension payments because you have to, by law. The state didn't for years. And their, their whole, the amount they were supposed to be paying to pensions annually was about $5 billion six years ago, seven years ago. They were paying zero, nothing, and had been doing that for years. And they're still catching up. And I think we're at, what, maybe 70% now of the actuarial determined amount that you're supposed to be paying in the pension system. So there's going to be three more years where each year the state increases by 10% the amount that it's putting into the pension system. And that's an $800 million increase on their budget every year. $800 million basically speaks for every last penny that comes into the state budget by way of ordinary revenue growth. If you don't have, you know, rather large tax increases or what have you. So for the next three years or so, the state's been and will continue to be on, I think, a, a process whereby they will catch up. And in three years, once they've caught up and the state is, is structurally sound again, and it will be, uh, they'll be able to, at that point, start, to making, start making some investments in whether it's the Division of Local Government Services or maybe it's they free up some of the money in the infrastructure bank that we'd like to be going to a lot of the suburban municipalities, but just can't because it needs to go to places that have severe lead problems or other problems. And they'll be able, the state will be able to make those investments that are needed. And that's, that's coming. And I back that up with my bank account. Every last penny I have um, by way of my savings is in municipal bonds in the state of New Jersey. Because I believe in the next three, five, seven years, it's going to do nothing but get, get stronger and better. You had eight years of cuts under Chris Christie probably going to have eight years of tax increases under the current governor. But between the two, they balance each other out. They balance each other out. They balance each other out. And, and in the end, it makes for a stronger state. You know, you had some reductions in spending, some increases in revenue. I think it's appropriate. It'll be a strong state in three to five years. And, and we'll see the investments of that at the local level that you haven't seen for the last decade. The premise of the question is, where do you see optimism? And I think I, I approach it from the perspective that things aren't that bad. Um, I love to tell my war stories um, during my time at the division. I, I loved it, but you had uh, certainly your, your fair share of challenges. But in all honesty, and, and, and I think being the immediate past director, I've worked with half the people in this, in this room, and I probably call three quarters of you friends. Um, the, the, the issue is this. The towns that I struggled with were an absolute minority of the towns and counties in the state of New Jersey. 565 and 21, and I had maybe five to 10 that were really a challenge in a handful. And at the end of the day, the division had the power, had the brain power, and I would have loved some more staff, but we had the people um, to deal with them. I do think that I'd like to see a next generation come up 
but I'm looking out in this room and I've worked with so many of you and you know, the, 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 the jokes about state workers or government workers, um, you know, being inferior or being lazy, nothing could be further than the truth. Um, I, you know, I, 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 to this day, I work with people that work all hours of the night. It's a very dedicated profession. It's a very intelligent profession. And with that, with, with that premise being stated out loud, I, I don't think there's a huge need for, for optimism because I, I think New Jersey has done a great job um, managing its municipalities and, and, and it starts with the people in this room. I know when, and this is advice to you, so I know when I, I came in, um, I said, Matt, I don't know anything about this job. And he says, look, I've prepared three envelopes for you. I left them in your desk. So when you're having a hard time, go look in the envelopes. So I was having a hard time learning the job. I remember the envelopes. I went and looked in the desk, and the first envelope I open it says, blame it on the, the last administration. <laughs> that worked for a while. So I was working along. A couple years later, I said, oh, what am I going to do now? Ah, I still have two envelopes left. So I went to the second envelope. And it said, reorganize. Oh, that's a great way to do it. We'll reorganize. We'll put this here. We'll combine this. You know, I said, that worked for a while. And then I was at the end of my rope again. I said, well, I got one last envelope. So I looked in the envelope, and it said, prepare three envelopes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Alec, you'd like to close this one out? <laughs> well, I guess if I was going to offer advice and, and uh, looking at what we're dealing with in today's uh, environment, I think it's really important for municipal government to have an advocate in the division. And I think that uh, the division has to stand up to other areas of state government. I know the struggle with Treasury has been ongoing since the day I walked in there. And, uh, you know, the, the KPMG report that they put out, you know, there's a problem with that. Um, you know, the, the numbers were wrong. And instead of the state looking and saying, you know, we could have a problem here, we have a AAA community that had a you know, overstated liability and it could adversely affect them, nothing's done. And they said they're going to use the report regardless of it being correct. Well, I think local government services, at least if I was there, and I'm not throwing any criticism, but I think I'd have a little bit of a problem with Treasury on that one because. Monroe Township, in this instance, isn't going to have a voice. They got to go through local government services, you know. So, where are you, AAA? But, um, you know, I think there's instances that are going to come up like that where the division, I mean, one of the reasons that I took the position in the beginning was because I saw since the death of Barry Skakowski, I saw a decay in the relationship between the division, the GFOA, and each one of us, I think uh, there was a, a real distancing and we're all on the same team. You know, we're not working, we shouldn't be working against each other, but we have to go through the division. So that's uh, for what it's worth. That's my advice. So it looks like our hour is nearly concluded. Um, just like to end by thanking all of you again for being here today and to note that you know, your experiences and your wisdom in this role and the sense of humor that you brought to the job makes it easier for those of us who are at the division today. I uh, appreciate the thoughts, and I hope all of you enjoyed getting the advice that I have to call on the phone to get at least once a week. So. <laughs>